Hey, Simon, uh, thank you for coming in. You have just such a remarkable uh, background, and it was such a joy seeing you speak at this uh, private CEO summit, <laughs> uh, really engaged, uh, you know, all of the CEOs and so on. So uh, you definitely have this uh, passion and this ability to excite and energize and be a catalyst for change. And uh, you're having so many different uh, um, create creative uh, innovation happening across so many so many different venues and but also with an impact uh, um, base so just just remarkable so thank you for coming in and sharing all of this with thank our you for inviting me it's a very exciting Stephen to talk to you so Simon you know my my audience uh, is uh, because I do a lot of analytics on it it's primarily CEOs and investors and and I would say those are the two big chunks mm -hmm. and then uh, scientists would be sort of the third bucket. Um, and then engineers, people typically with technical background. And then uh, I do have also uh, students sometimes or people early in their careers and they're looking for some kind of uh, mentorship ideas or, or career path uh, ideas, things like that. So because of that audience, uh, all of them are always interested in, you know, what were the inflection points in your life that created this wonderful person that you are today? Maybe there's two or three, and it could, it could have happened when you were like two years old or three or or five or when you're in college or or afterwards. So, Oh, <clears throat> so great. It's a great question. Um, so I, I was born in English. You can tell from my accent, but lived in the Middle East for, for quite some time. Boarding school. I ended up doing uh, speaking languages, learning French and German. Point being, I traveled around the world, looked at the language from the world from lots of different points of view uh, and through different languages and um, developed kind of real interest in different pers people's perspectives. And I think seeing the world from different places, living in different countries gives you a, gives you the ability to look at the world in, in multiple different ways. I um, had a military career first and then found my way into uh, consulting and working for the World Economic Forum and um, loved the, the non-profit world, but felt that I needed to kind of learn the business skills to make a real impact. And and that's how I ended up at Salesforce. And I just ended up at Salesforce at the time when it was small and exploding in growth. And so I ended up 14 years in Salesforce from it growing from 2,000 people to nearly 80,000 people. And Having multiple roles in that organization taught me so, so much. I saw a company over all of its different arcs of growth, um, but I was just really excited at the end of that to get back to where I am now. So I, my journey has been really um, weird with not much logic that I could clearly express. Uh, I think I just said yes to every opportunity and it's taken me to, to this moment in front of you. Well, I, I can definitely see this idea of, of diversity inclusion. You're, you're, you have this very inclusive uh, way about you in terms of the way you interact and, and how you do your, your work. And I find in, in prior interviews I've done, people who travel a lot or speak multiple languages and you're fluent in multiple languages and so on, I find they're, they tend to be more inclusive and because of, the, I guess, that variety of experience and, I guess, uh, the military uh, would have given you some insights because it's so structured. Yeah. <laughs> and then the World Economic Forum, you know, there's sort of very broad thinking and they, you know, interacting with all these different leaders and uh, thought leadership would have that mindset. And then, as you mentioned, this journey you've had, well, uh, Salesforce from really from its uh, very early beginnings to becoming uh, quite a, a prominent force in the world today. And, and so I can see all of those elements uh, shaping who you are. So uh, thank you for sharing all of that. Now, can you can you talk about how you started with time and, and what you're doing with time? Well, I was <clears throat> I was at Salesforce, uh, Chief Innovation Officer there in my last role, and a lot of my time was spent speaking and working with leaders of some of the largest companies in the world. And as many of those companies went into COVID. Um, that was a destabilizing experience for all of them. And so figuring out how they responded uh, and, and not only got through COVID, but came out of COVID stronger than when they went in was a really, really interesting question. And of course, a lot of that is down to 
technology? Do you have the right type of technology in your organization, especially when you send all of your people from your call center home? How can they be operating at home uh, as effectively, if not more effectively than before? And so a lot of organizations figured out that their digital strategy wasn't strong as they thought. But one other thing became very, very clear during COVID, and that is that every organization also had to be really strong in its engagement with civil society and its in its role beyond purely being a business, thinking much more carefully about its role in society. And so it became really clear that that any organization that was going to be successful had to have a, a kind of a proper new DNA, uh, a double helix of not just digital, but also sustainable. And um, as I started to work on that and got very excited, I think Mark Benioff, the, the CEO of Salesforce, saw that. Uh, he called me in. I went over and had lunch with him. And he says, why don't you leave Salesforce? Come and join me. Let's um, build a business focusing on this. And in particular, we were really excited about the mid-market companies, that the largest companies in the world have <clears throat> quite a large amount of resources, the money, the people, the discretionary budget, to be able to say, okay, let's let's rally around this issue. But when you're a small or mid-sized company, you don't have the luxury of being able to create a dedicated team focusing on sustainability, for example. How can we serve those organizations and give them the same capabilities as big companies became a really exciting question to solve. And that and that's really interesting. Uh, I guess Mark bought time too, right? And Mark owned time. Yeah. And uh, and so I came over, we, we, um, um, we bought CO2.com, the URL. Uh, I became president of time. And um, at the same time, a CEO of CO2. And we, we kind of rebranded that time CO2. And um, and that was really it. And and we we looked for a for over the course of all of last year, the focus was really on designing the company and building something that was truly based on trust. Because trust is the single most important ingredient if you're really going to engage that group of companies on an issue so important like uh, uh, like sustainability. Um, and we what we found was that every company has to do two things clearly first. And probably priority number one is decarbonize, get off the carbon economy, um, find ways of swapping, you know, very important high carbon activities for low or no carbon activities. But as every company goes on that mission, this doesn't happen overnight. It's very hard for organizations to make that shift. What else should they be doing? Well, they should also be, um, you know, they should also be supporting programs that, that help others decarbonize, to help others remove carbon out of the atmosphere, uh, reduce their emissions, um, support biodiversity, and support climate justice. And that's broadly under the rubric of offsetting, although it doesn't have to be. But it's it's solving that problem, helping companies fund other organizations. And, um, and that's where we spent our time, really looking hard at that. And offsetting has been broken for, for quite some time, about well, according to a Californian study, over 80% of uh, all of the offsets in the carbon market are just junk, is the official term. And then a report came out only a couple of months ago stating that that's 94%. So almost all the uh, carbon credits in the market are junk. That's a terrible uh, statistic. But what's more scary is that how are you supposed to find the good quality if you're a you know, mid-sized company, you don't have expertise, you certainly don't know, um, you know, who to speak to about this. And even if you did, you'll be spending hundreds of hours on each project. And you'd probably just find one project that you wanted. That is not what uh, a good company should be doing. And so we basically said, let's create a utility that can be the world's best answer to that. We'll go and find the world's best climate scientists create partnerships with them, create partnerships with the top universities, build a team of experts who can go out and rummage through all of these thousands of projects out there, verify them, validate them, do their scientific research, um, and then pay a lot of consultants. We have layer upon layer of consultants who do all types of technical uh, reviews of these projects as well, in order that we can find ones that we can put our hands on our heart and go, that's about as high quality as you're, you're, you're likely to find in the carbon market. 
So that was kind of the first thing we did. We really wanted to go and help find those projects and make sure that they were of the very highest quality, according to science. But then it was like, well, what types of companies, what types of projects should we bring together um, and enable you know, these small and mid-sized companies to, to support? And that's where we really started looking at what the planet needs. And we worked very closely with uh, Oxford University, Cambridge University, Stanford, Berkeley, uh, ASU, um, UCSB. The list goes on of, of organizations we worked with. But it became very clear that what the planet needs at a scientific level is not just more trees. And that's a lot. That's mostly what companies go and do. Let's go and throw some trees at the problem. Excuse me. What, what the, the planet needs is a, an array of different things. The, the climate is a system. And so companies need to support that in multiple different ways. And so we built a portfolio that is 40% uh, focused on uh, carbon removals, 30% on carbon uh, emissions reduction, but also 20% on supporting projects that um, protect old growth forests, mangroves, peatlands, uh, and then 10%, which is pure innovation. We built this portfolio that was really the best systemic answer to the climate problem. And that became that became our first real product. But the aim behind all of that was if we could build the world's best answer and make it an easy button so that the average company without any real effort could go out and do and get the world's best answer to the problem and serve the planet in the best way, we just make we just make it a layup for them. So that's what we've been focusing on. You know, that's interesting. You, you mentioned that uh, typically large companies, multinationals already have sustainability teams. Mm. They can um, put the resources towards this. And, and it's interesting. You know, I'm, I'm in weekly meetings and biweekly meetings with these multinational uh, CEO groups. Um, I, it's all pro bono. So I, I want to make that clear to the audience. And uh, and they mentioned that they're actually well on their way on that sustainability side. And that's really purposeful leadership and so on. But you're saying that there's this gap with uh, small and medium-sized uh, companies because they just don't have that kind of capability. So you've created this trusted uh, portfolios of, of uh, projects and things that they can get into and, and realize that it's it's sort of the best in the world today and, and get involved in some way. So what would that involvement entail? So let's say they go to CO2.com and they see something that's really interesting. What's the next step? So the the next that we didn't want there to be lots of next steps. These companies, we didn't want there to be lots of choice either. That was one feedback we got. It's like the more choice you give us, the more confused we are again. So we said, let's build, we built Planet's portfolio. And we went out and we worked um with some amazing scientists on building this. And if you go to CO2.com, you literally scroll down, click on the portfolio, see it, and then decide how much you want to fund. And then it comes it becomes a question of, well, how much you want to spend on this versus the other things you should be doing. And this is where there's a, a, a broader climate journey that every company needs to go on. And for large companies, you've got multiple different things you're doing. You have a an array of different activities ranging from supporting charities to perhaps you've got a, a, a fund you've got an innovation fund, you might have some offsetting, you have lots of different things going on in a very large company focusing on climate, employee engagement, etc. For a small company, you might not have anything. And so what do you do? Well, we do want every company on the planet, irrespective of what industry they're in, to be looking inside their organization going, what are the no brainer things that I should be doing to reduce my carbon footprint? So that's the first thing every company should be doing. But once you've figured out that there are only a few levers you can pull this year. Yeah. Then it's like, what's your carbon footprint that you have remaining? And let's say it's a hundred tons. And there are different tools that enable you to go and find out what that footprint is. We're building one ourselves and we'll have that soon. You are, you're, you, you now know how much footprint is kind of your, um, your uh, problem. And then you, you go to CO2.com, put in that number and it'll tell you, uh, what you need to spend. And we work on $50 per ton, which is the appropriate price for, for a ton of, of carbon that's that's removed out of the atmosphere. And, and you use that and you invest that money. So 100 tons times 50, and that gives you your budget. <clears throat> Plumb that in. And what you get back is uh, not just 
you know, a good feeling and the money goes out of your account. What you get back is a dashboard that shows you your impact. And that's not just the tons of carbon that you bought. You bought 100 tons of carbon, let's say, in this instance. But what you get back is a dashboard that gives you the clear statistics, the information um, on how many tons of carbon were removed, how many tons of CO2 were reduced, pulled out of the atmosphere from um, through other projects um, that you that, uh, reduced. And then third, how many tons of carbon was protected in old growth forests. But you also have metrics for your impact on nature and biodiversity. And third, on community and climate justice. So we wanted to make it really clear that that money was not just buying carbon offsets, but actually having a material measurable impact on, on different things in, in the world of carbon, different things in the world of nature, and different things in the world of climate justice. And that dashboard is, of course, then copyable, pasteable, put it into your annual report. And then on top of that, we then send you information, studies, stories of what your money is doing in these projects and how these projects are evolving over the course of the year. Because this isn't just about throwing money at the problem. This is about activating your employees, your customers, your investors in your excitement about being a company that's supporting nature. So we wanted to give companies the tools to be really articulate about how they're supporting these projects and what these projects are actually doing. And, and that was the big learning for us. When we started, we thought, let's just go and build the world's best pro portfolio give it to companies and then they'll feel they've done it really well like kind of the checkbox but what was the big learning for us was these companies yes they wanted that and they wanted it of the highest order of quality but they needed to be able to talk about it and that was a really big learning for us that the communications tools the um proof and the stories that we give them were as if not more important than the actual project itself that's really fascinating so you're about to uh, release a tool so they can measure what their um, sort of issues are from a carbon standpoint, carbon footprint. And then you have the ability to get really trusted uh, investments in this area where, where they can do offsets. And like you said, over 90% is junk and you vetted all of this to make sure it's pure, it's, it's very good. Yeah. And then they get this dashboard so they can monitor it. And as you mentioned, put it into their annual reports and and monthly reports to their employees, they can do communications on it. And, and then there's this sort of uh, mass communication sort of synergy that occurs on companies that uh, decide to engage. And are you gonna then, uh, as time, produce a cumulative report and maybe do a sort of an annual CO2 report of, of the results in some way? Absolutely. This is all, when you look at the climate problem, you know, the heart of it, it's a communication problem, honestly. So uh, yes, is the answer. We will be absolutely producing a report on the, the CO2 portfolio in multiple different ways, bringing these stories to life. We're doing, we're building other portfolios, enormous amounts of storytelling that can be done around what we call these, these ecopreneurs out there that, that these companies are supporting. And of course, we're telling the stories of projects that are have a truly high quality output, verifiable output. But what's really exciting is that as we've gone on this journey, back to your whole point about storytelling, is what we found is most organizations don't know where to start on their climate journey. They are just lost and they get it. They know that they've got to do something. And in many cases, they've got really, really big supply chain champions who, you know, they're their big customers who are pleading with them, begging them. Some of the largest companies in the world at the CEO level one of the single most large problems is how do we get the supply chain? How do we get all these small and medium-sized businesses to reduce their carbon footprint? This is the scope three footprint of the, of the large companies. And it's really, really hard. And they're begging these small companies to measure their footprint, provide the data, and so that they can help them with programs, uh, reduce their footprint, but they're not. And the trick is here, and the problem here is that these, these small companies, they just, first of all, they don't want to surrender their data because they don't know how that data will be used. Uh, and second, they, they don't know what to do. Like they've been given guidance, but they can't turn that guidance into action. They can't connect spending a lot of money on climate action that they don't really understand what to do with business value in their organization. And they don't know exactly what to do. They're time poor. They don't have a lot of resources. 
And so what they really need are stories, not just stories of the uh, the, the projects that, that Time CO2 has got in its portfolio. They need stories of companies like them who uh, and what they're doing. How are companies like them, you know, moving to renewable energy? How are companies like them, you know, virtualizing that IT or swapping from a diesel fleet to an electric fleet? What specifically are they doing that can be copyable? And they don't want these stories locked up in 50 page PDFs, but that's where they are today. They are locked, doomed. In, and, and nobody was going to read a PDF of that size and actually execute it. We will not PDF ourselves to to climate uh, action that, that way. And so the storytelling becomes enormously important. And the reason I'm saying all of that, Stephen, is that as um, as we look at that problem at time, time has built the portfolio and that becomes the easy button to supercharge organizations ability to go and and do offsetting properly go beyond offsetting easily but we also want to help companies with that bigger problem and so a large part of what you'll see coming out of time is not just the stories around the portfolios but stories around all of these mid-sized companies and what they're doing on their climate journey simple stuff that makes sense here's how i invested it here's my impact on climate but here's how it made business sense for me and those stories we need thousands of those stories. We need we need them to be at the fingertips of all of these businesses. That the, will create the movement. That will enable these companies to, to actually act with confidence. That's really, really interesting. In fact, I'm engaged in supporting pro bono, as I mentioned, these um, uh, multinational CEOs and um, with a group called the CEO Leadership Alliance. And then they're working on a national collaborative, well, 25 uh, leadership groups but they could then embrace this and, and suggest to their thousands of uh, supply chain companies to to embrace it as well, right? As a hundred percent, a hundred percent. And so, take any um, supply chain leader. They may be having, uh, they may have a hundred thousand suppliers. Right. They probably have a lot of projects already running, doing everything they can to persuade, cajole, push, force those hundred thousand organizations to move. It's just difficult. And by the way, there's a lot of great work that's there, a lot of fantastic information, a lot of great subsidies, a lot of great benefits, but that but the companies aren't moving. It's a communication challenge. But now imagine turning a media engine at that supply chain and campaigning it into action, taking that amazing insights that's locked and hidden in PDFs and translating it into insights that the average person will read and go, wow, this is awesome. While on the bus, reading it, with, with flipping through with their thumb, send it to the team, and the team will read it and action it. That won't happen with a, a PDF, but it could happen with a campaign-based approach where information flows to the leaders in those organizations and their teams in just the right time, in just the right way. Information that will help them make really good decisions. Information that will help them you know, figure out how to improve the credit score, the credit rating of their business or make simple changes. And it's not just the how-to information they need, they need the stories of what others are doing. So that's a large part of where um, of, of where we've been focusing our, our time behind the scenes as well. And of course, that's led us into all types of incredible partnerships, because this isn't something that Time CO2, Time can do on its own. We're partnering with some of the very best universities, the very best NGOs, working really closely with WBCSD, uh, with um, uh, the We Mean Business Coalition and the SME Climate Hub, with the World Economic Forum, um, and of course, all of these universities as well. So there's an enormous amounts of incredible partners that are out there. But if they can all come together in kind of like an Avengers, um, and, and then they can be at service of that supply chain uh, leader we were just talking about um, in the context of a, a media-driven kind of campaign, that can really change the game in, in these supply chains. You uh, mentioned uh, earlier, or you were at a YPO, a, a sort of a private YPO Global Impact Summit, and, and uh, some of this went public, so that's the reason we can talk about it, right? Uh, they posted on it. And and so that's one of the largest uh, private CEO leadership communities, and you have a relationship uh, with them prior to this. 
And and so that that's a great program, right, uh, for that community. Yeah. I reached out to the entrepreneurship uh, community as well. There's an entrepreneurship org, and there's others, uh, Startup Without Borders, and others that are maybe more earlier in their journey to get them engaged in some way. Um, I haven't yet, actually, but that's a fantastic idea. Um, the, the truth, well, just to underline your point about the, the YPO, the, the Young Presidents Organization, the YPO is an incredible organization. I've got immense amount of uh, respect for them. And there are thousands of organizations in the YPO who are already well and truly on their climate journey, doing amazing things. And yet their story is not known. And if more people knew some of the incredible things those individual companies are doing, and in many cases, not on their own, but together in groups, it would be very, very inspiring to others as well. Um, but this is something that entrepreneurs, and there are great entrepreneurs who are who are fixing problems, creating the future that people don't know about. I think one of the most in- interesting observations we've had on this journey is that there are many organizations out there with incredible leaders, incredible teams who are working 25 hours a day, improving their business, doing everything they can to make a living. And they are incrementally improving their business every day. They're taking that wing nut, cranking it one more turn to the right every day. And they won't survive in the world that is being created. The climate crisis is so severe that whole industries will fundamentally reinvent themselves off the carbon economy into the new world. The world of air transport will lead to whole different um, powertrains for for aircraft, whole different aircraft types, which will lead to whole different types of airports. We won't need massive hubs as much. This will redistribute how uh, the, the infrastructure is today. It'll change the face of that industry. Every industry is going through the same, trucking, um, agriculture, retail. They're all going through enormous changes, but sometimes those changes are one degree separated from from the players in the industry and they don't see the change that's coming and so you're going to be on the wrong side of history on the right side of history if you're either preparing for that change and getting ready for it and moving now and starting to really get to grips with what that change is going to mean for your business or you're just cranking away turning that wing that one crank to the right and imp- optimizing your business into yesterday and uh and off a cliff so we're seeing lots of we're seeing that divergence happen and we don't want people to fail so we need to inspire them to understand the changes that are happening see what they can do see how the change that that they need to make can become really powerful for the future of their business so simon and, and to the audience so all of my interviews are unscripted so I'm just going to do a time check. I, I was assuming we had an hour, but I want to make sure that we do have an hour. Or oh, do absolutely. You... Yeah. Okay. <laughs> That's great. Um, you know, I work with a lot of governments. In fact, uh, uh, I work on sovereign fund investment committee work as well. And I can only talk about it because some of it is under security, requires security clearance, and which I have only when they go public. And I only talk about what they go public on. And of course, governments are really interesting in enabling business and making direct investments and doing fund of funds and directly to VCs. And they're investing directly in companies as well. And so are you reaching out to governments to see if, you know, because this is such a seamless platform and tools and so on, and it's trusted that you built because you've got your brand behind it. So you you want to make sure it is trusted. Have you reached out to the 193 governments that are part of the UN? So the ecosystem. Well, <clears throat> where is the, so the answer is yes, but um, so I, I left Salesforce in January last year. Um, uh, we I've built an incredible team, um, but it's still quite small, and so we haven't yet stretched all the way into uh, full government uh, engagement, which. There's a lot of people you need to speak to and, and um, suddenly you need a very large team. Um, that said, we are working with the US uh, Department of State. We have some phenomenal conversations with them. They're doing some really interesting things around the energy transition accelerator. Um, what we've, we've been less focused so much on the, on the government side of things as, as actually working really closely with 
a large number of the uh, non-governmental organizations who are uh, the nonprofits who are orbiting around the kind of building the trust engine around the carbon markets. So the um, Science-Based Targets Initiative, the SBTI, is used by many large organizations as kind of a, a validator of their, of their climate progress. And the SBTI has been doing a lot to evolve its thinking on uh, and, and guidance to companies on how to not only do you know the decarbonization within their business, but also how to think about carbon credits. We've been working very closely with the Voluntary Carbon Markets um, Initiative, the VCMI, and the ICVCM. There's a lot of acronyms <laughs> in this universe, uh, all of whom are amazing organizations comprised of top climate scientists from different parts of the world and, and people from, from, from other nonprofits like the CDP. And they're all coming together to really try and put more structure, more rigor around things like the carbon markets so that more people can engage with more confidence in that. So we're heavily involved um, in, in, um, in those with those organizations. But governments are incredibly important. We know that, for example, the work that, um, that led to the IRA, um, the Inflation Reduction Act, was uh, amazing. And it's now triggered incredible amounts of innovation in the US. And now in the European Union, they're enacting a, a similar approach, which will, again, spark innovation around climate action. Back to the points I was making earlier, the future is going to be so interesting and so vibrant, but we need to innovate our way there. And government can help by putting in place legislation that inspires that um, change. But ultimately, this, and, and John Kerry says this a lot, underlines this point a lot, if we're really going to solve the climate act, climate crisis, we cannot sit down and wait for government to do it for us. Business is the single pa most powerful tool that we have on the planet. The markets are the single most powerful tool we have to actually create change. Because that that's where we, we're going to need. We need like three to five trillion dollars every year for the next 30 years um, to be plowed into infrastructure. That money's not going to come from governments. It's not going to come from taxes like that. It's got to come from businesses understanding that they can make those changes and those changes will drive business value for them. And it needs consumers to understand and support that. And so that, I think, is kind of the the change that we're seeing happening. So I, I can see you have all of these different threads, like a mycelium web of, of, of change, <laughs> That's quite a crazy. of, 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 of uh, partners and so on. So you can use people like ourselves who are engaged in different government programs and uh, that are out there in the audience as well. Uh, I'm just thinking uh, sovereign funds would be a good one because they are investing in lots of companies or uh, companies like BlackRock, which have what, nine to 10 trillion. I know their portfolio has dropped a bit, but but maybe nine to 10 trillion of investments and things like that. Are you are you working with those investment groups at all directly? Yes, well, in a number of different ways, <clears throat> we're in conversation with a lot of them because they themselves also you know, value us as a service. We're back office. We're basically a back office that goes out and finds the very best high quality uh, projects and, and makes sense of them. And, and in many cases, that's a service that that many of these organizations can use as well. So on that side, we're also finding that a lot of these um, financial institutions have got a large, you know, they've got a large um, uh, book of business. They've got a large number of uh, investments that they've made and they're financed emissions. That's their scope three problem. And they're looking at all of the organizations that they've invested in going, how do we help reduce the footprint of those companies? which again is exactly the same problem that we're solving in a different way. How do we help those small and mid-sized businesses that we're investing in reduce their carbon footprint? And when they do that, a lot of their, they're giving them advice. They're telling them things they can do. They're telling them what they can do to decarbonize. But all of those businesses also will have a remaining footprint that they can't reduce themselves that they want to buy offsets for, but they want to buy high quality offsets. And so we are becoming the partner to many of those financial institutions to be their kind of high quality offset provider as a service to their um their uh 
their supply chain, their uh, their investment companies. Have you connected with Michael Meehan, who chairs this UK Financial uh, Sustainability uh, Alliance? No, I, I think they represent about 15 trillion US um, in assets uh, under management. Uh, definitely, it, so I've done an interview with them where he says that it's really difficult to find trusted groups uh, where they can do investments and so on. So I think Michael Meehan would be a good one to connect with. I love that. And, and honestly, Stephen, that's what we spent so much of last year doing was going out and building trust, right. building trust that we, we weren't out selling. We we're out going, how do we build something that stands the trust test? And, you know, getting all people like um, Johan Rockstrom to be an advisor to us, Catherine Hayhoe to be an advisor to us was for us a enormous moment because we couldn't have done that unless we had really proven success on many many multiple occasions that what we were doing was very genuine authentically focusing on trust and so uh, I, I love that you pointed that and, and I've just written Michael's name down I'd love to connect with him after this. Uh, the other day I had a meeting with uh, Chris Goya, who's the founder of Leaders on Purpose and um, they did one of the original studies uh, Purposeful Leaders that are multinationals and it was a private report some of it where they interviewed them and then they produce a report and they're going to do a re-up of that report in a new new cohort uh, definitely that community be one that you'd probably be interested in connecting with especially from a supply chain standpoint mm. and they're already on that journey um, there's the Danish Management Society as well they're four to five years into making sure that all of their 4,000 companies are embedded in this sustainability journey. So they're quite sophisticated and they even released a uh, a dashboard tool to monitor this work. And they must have now over a thousand use cases that they share internally. So I think they would be a good one for you to uh, connect with. And then, uh, as I mentioned, the sovereign fund, some of the really big ones are now looking at like the Norwegian sovereign fund and others. They're really, actually all of them, especially the Western ones too, are looking at how can we be sustainable in what we're doing? And then because they're doing such massive investments um, and, and doing recommendations to all of the VCs that they invest in and the fund of funds that invest in indirect investments, then it's a way of, especially because it's a trusted tool and it's easy, it's already mm. available and so on. I mean, I would go after uh, them. I mean, I'm just percolating with lots of thought. There's a CEO founder in Southeast Asia, her name is Thipaparn. Uh, uh, she's out of um, Thailand. Her name is, uh, we call her Kun B or B for short. Um, she definitely is the beacon in that region, but she's also part of the CP Group family. And I would say that what she's doing is a beacon for all of the conglomerates that they're working, uh, that they have. I think they have about 20 conglomerates. So definitely somebody um, uh, to try to maybe get in as an advisor. And she has... Uh, in the first 15 interviews, the leaders on purpose did this program at Harvard, the World Bank, and Unilever. She was one of the CEOs interviewed because she is so progressive in her thinking on sustainability. Yeah. I'm, I'm actually heading out to um, uh, meet with them um, in a few weeks. I'll mention this, but I think, God, if you got her uh, involved, I think she can open up. Uh, many, many different regions because they got uh, investments throughout the world, including now into India and Africa and so on. So, I mean, I'm, I'm thinking of maybe a hundred <laughs> different groups <laughs> that would love what, what you're <laughs> doing. And and then, uh, you know, the audience could be your, their, your ambassadors, right? Because you created this wonderful platform, tools and so on for engagement, right? And trusted um, investment in essence to, to, to bring peace of mind, and as you mentioned, they could all these narratives they can share, and then they could just percolate like exponentially, right? So I just just love all of these uh, all of this work that you're doing. Let's let's now uh, kind of shift this conversation and, mm. and and where do you see climate going and, and all of the different ramifications of climate from uh, clean energy and energy sources and so on to. Uh, new kinds of ways of computation, like quantum computing. There's analog computing that can maybe address new materials, new kinds of batteries, or 
or way, uh, uh, ways to address climate. You saw uh, Bill Gates uh, last year uh, talk about how uh, on the agricultural side of climate that he's thinking of the best way to address it is through um, new hybrid seeds. For mm. example, you had the World uh, Food Program and um, they have this 100 billion meals idea because that's associated with climate. You have... Uh, the health situation occurring around the world because of, of climate. Uh, there's the tipping points, of course, the uh, this massive uh, glacier uh, ice mass in, in Antarctica is progressing much faster in some ways than they think and, and maybe could degrade uh, much faster than they originally thought. Uh, there's all of the fossil uh, carbon that, it, that there, there's these massive cracks that are appearing in Siberia and so on that can really again, can accelerate all of what's happening, maybe much faster. What are your thoughts on all of these elements? And then the innovation that's occurring, one that I think I mentioned earlier uh, in a private conversation with you, and I did a, an article on them, and that's uh, uh, the University of California, Irvine, where the entire school, and all entire university, and all 14 schools of that university, and, so, and there's two Nobel Prize winners within that ecosystem. The entire community has said, we're going to address this. Uh, because we're basically a city as well. They have their own power plants, their own bus system. The entire university is now, and all of their schools are are going to address this in mass. And for what I I believe, they're probably the only one right now in the world that's doing this as an entire ecosystem. And James Bullock is embedded into that. Um, again, happy to do introductions as well. But cool. so, what do you, what are your views on this? Uh, you know. How, ways to address it are we at the past the tipping points and and so on so um well maybe you start on the, the the negative first i mean i didn't realize this when i got into this fully just how serious yeah climate depression is right. if you're a if you're a climate scientist or somebody who's living day to day in this universe you're exposed to the the true facts of the impact of climate change already on our planet and the proximate nature of further devastating tipping points, it's easy to be very depressed. And 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 the truth is that there's a lot of very depressed people as a result of really understanding the, the situation. Um, we are in a world where we are already experiencing terrible uh, impacts to, to people's lives, not necessarily as much in the developed world, but certainly already in the developing world. So we're already seeing an unfair just sort of uh, distribution of, of the impact of climate change. So this is not something that will happen to us soon. It, it has already happened and it will just, it's just a matter of how much worse it's going to get and can we improve it, which is a kind of a depressing thought. And, and but flipping to the good side, um, I truly believe that we as humanity <clears throat> will not survive, just survive this, but we will um, innovate and thrive through it. But we need to fix this, not just with en enormous amounts of innovation, but with enormous amounts of compassion as well, because it truly has divided the planet. And the, those who have caused the problem are reaping less of the impact than those who haven't, who are reaping more of the impact right now. Um, and similarly, we can't be telling the developing nations what to do and how they should get off carbon immediately when they're just trying to figure out how, you know, they evolve and, and increase the quality of their life and fight through some of the changes that are going on uh, to their societies. But with that said, there is enormous hope. There is incredible innovation in every aspect of human life. And it does, it starts in the agricultural, because if you can't eat, you can't feed um, others, then we, we have major problems. And, and we know that not just through the Ukraine war, but through um, some devastating um, droughts, that there's been real disruption to, you know, the, the world's um, food systems. And that has already had major problems. And we know that that's going to get worse over time. We know we're going to have to innovate there in order to be able to feed populations we also know that there are large tracts of um land that are no longer going to be able to support um farming because of temperature change 
So we need to be able to either find new crops that can be grown there, or we need to grow crops in other places that haven't we haven't grown crops in before. And that's going to need innovation at that level. And there's a, a whole bunch of great work that's going on there. Um, but we also need to look at the agricultural system that we have today and innovate that. We have been waging war on the top six inches of our planet, the top six inches of our earth, um, with pesticides and insecticides and fertilizers that are um, all basically a derivative of um, chemical uh, programs that were developed during the war. Those companies that, that developed those as basically to you know win wars, those, those companies now became insecticide and pesticide companies and we've been waging war on our planet and the top six inches of our of our of our planet that soil is pretty much completely depleted we are so close to turning our um, soil into desert all around the world just by the farming techniques we've been using for decades so there's a, a really exciting changes as people figure out new models of farming so that's on the food and agriculture side and really saying how can we reinvent how we think about soil. And we need a lot more motion there. We need to support farmers to make that transition. And, um, and I'm hopeful that, that we'll, we'll do that. The energy system also is incredibly important. The fuel that what's driven all of these economic changes that have happened, what's driven the first industrial revolution, second industrial revolution, third industrial revolution, fourth industrial revolution, each of those have been driven by carbon by fossil fuels. We cannot have the fifth industrial revolution driven by fossil fuels. We need new forms of fuel. And it's really exciting that now solar is cheaper than, um, uh, than, than, than petrol, but we need to do a lot more to, to disseminate that, to disseminate uh, electrification and enable uh, people to buy vehicles and, and be able to charge them wherever they will live. Um, but we're making good progress there. Um, and then you've got innovation across every other um, aspect of life. Um, innovation in the in retail through the circular economy. It's amazing what IKEA is doing now to um, uh, to recycle mattresses. So every part of our life can be recycled. And if we start to look at the world as everything is recyclable, um, we'll break this consumption uh, mental model that we've built over the last uh, sixty years. And, uh, and and reinvent how we think about uh, consumerism. So I think there's a lot of innovation uh, and a lot of great technologies. Honestly, if we can solve nuclear fission, <laughs> then job done. Um, but putting that to one side, <laughs> there's a lot of great innovation. Yeah, I, I, I guess you're you're also talking about nuclear fusion, where where oh, fusion uh, as well. Yes. Yeah, where we can get maybe more positive out out energy that yes. we're putting in and, and we've had some sort of uh, breaking uh, innovation that's uh, made some great news worldwide. I think at Lawrence Livermore and some of the U.S. laboratories, for example. Yes. Maybe right. that's what they're doing in France. On the biomedical innovation side, in fact, uh, next a week after next, I'm speaking at this uh, Terrasac Institute of Biomedical Innovation Summit, and I'm on their leadership board. And we've created a, a, a way to uh, culture um, meat so you don't have to have animals. You, you can actually grow them in bioreactors. Exactly. Right? So, and uh, the fact that there, that's probably going to be a topic area. So there's a lot of innovation on the biomedical stuff. I'll mention your work, by the way, because they're very much interested in climate and uh, your work you. very much resonate with what they're doing as well. So, okay, now um, let's go sort of, what do you what do you what's the best case for you? <laughs> best case. You know, let's say in the short term, let's say in yeah. uh, by 2025. The best case is that um the best case is that a lot of organizations really decide that um that to get on their climate journey and that they look at what they can do inside their organization <clears throat> and they start making material changes and start making changes that reduce their carbon footprint year over year by greater than 7.5%, which is kind of carbon law. At the same time, they they look at what they're not being able to reduce and they decide that they're going to go and support programs with the highest order of quality and that they come to, to us and we become their service provider. 
we don't want to just work with individuals. We want to work with whole supply chains. And then we'll have supply chain leaders come to us and say, hey, we want to build a, a portfolio for our industry. And, you know, we're Pepsi, Coke and Diageo. And we got together and we've got between us 450,000 suppliers. We need a we need a portfolio. And you guys provide us that portfolio. And we go and build a portfolio that's designed specifically to serve the needs and interests of their business. Um, and similarly, we <clears throat> end up working with different uh, uh, focus groups. We find that there's a really big group of, of companies that desperately want to support the ocean. And we've, we've already half built our ocean portfolio. So we're working to serve those organizations. And then at the same time, time is also uh, really out there understanding and capturing the stories of of the average company and what they're doing on their climate journey and capturing that in a simple way, cataloging it and enabling others to um, to, to benefit from, from those stories. And that's a big part of what I want to do is create, is become the storyteller for all those organizations who are on their journey, celebrate the progress that they're making in order that they can celebrate their progress to their customers, help them legitimize their, their progress to their customers and then create a movement of companies moving on the journey. And that will be the most important thing. We have to create a movement of companies who are just, and this is not the companies who are out there at the bleeding edge, getting the gold medal for the triathlon that they've just won, because there's only ever going to be one of those winners. I'm talking about the average company. I'm talking about the company that everybody's looking at going, hey, I could do that too. Why did nobody ever explain it to me that easily that I could do this? Why aren't we doing it like that? Why are we not, uh, how can we create this feeling across boards all over the world of like, are we the only ones not moving? That is what I would love us to do. I guess with small and medium-sized companies too, I'm seeing they're feeling the pressure of their children and who are either Gen Z or alpha generation, Gen Z's, let's say 1997 uh, Ford or, or uh, Gen uh, alpha generation 2012, uh, and forward. So, and that's forcing them to rethink what they're doing with their existing companies and moving in this direction, right? And I mean, uh, ultimately, 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 the newer, younger generation are very much engaged, much more than than the older generation. So, so that will drive some of this, right? And 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 it's not a situation where you can ignore it. You have to start engaging in some way and, and thinking about this in some way and you've created this this way that they can get involved they can uh, it's much simpler for them it's not how do i do it and it's a fog you've laid out a complete pathway a framework and then also ways to execute and to measure it and then to share that narrative so that it spreads right so uh, do you think about that as well from oh my goodness all the time are you speaking at like uh, uh, Yunga, the Young uh, General Assembly or the uh, One World, which is of two youth or YNG, which is the 22 to 25,000 y YPOers who are the children of YPOers uh, to get oh, back to it? Because then they can talk to their parents and say, hey, who own companies, right? This is... Yes. Uh, so the answer is no, not yet, but I'm kicking myself as I'm as I'm hearing you talk, because honestly, one of the reasons why I'm even doing this, why I'm sat here um, talking about it like this is because of my children. And and I'm like, what am I doing with my life? <clears throat> I'm a successful professional, but what am I doing for them? And really, you could distill it down to I'm basically working in a company uh, as part of an economy that is taking their future away from them. Because the old economy is doing nothing but shortchanging the future economies. We are, over the last 40 years, one of the single most impactful things that my generation has done, now us as leaders, is kill half of all life on the planet. What a great legacy that is. We are stealing out of our kids' uh, piggy banks now in order to fuel our life, and we're ripping them off. And it's no wonder that these youth uh, organizations are now exist with voice because they are pissed, and they have all the right to be. And 
it's it's correct that we should have them at the table. They are because they are angry uh, with all the justifications. So yes, and I'm seeing more CEOs who are like my daughter has shamed me into this and I feel so bad it took her so long um the power of the daughter the power of the children to get these CEOs to wake up and smell the coffee and realize I, we can't do this is really important and as we look right now <clears throat> at the organizations who are prepared to even listen to us it's not every company in the world it's not every CEO in the world most CEOs don't have those daughters tapping them on the shoulder, unfortunately. And we see this kind of bell curve distribution, the Pareto curve. And at the forward edge of that is like organizations who are prepared to act now. These are CEOs who wake up, leap out of bed and be like, we're doing this. I don't care. We will figure out the economics of this. We have to do it. It's the right thing to do. Behind them is this group called the fast follower. These are CEOs who are like, I don't know if this is a good idea. But if those guys do well, I'm I'm going to follow quickly and probably do it better than them and make some money. And then you've got the middle of the market. <laughs> this group is largely un inactive right now. They are not activated. And we need to do something to engineer them to wake up and smell the coffee. And then you've got the laggards at the back. These are these are organizations who even when we set their roof on fire, they won't they won't leave their home and 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 get on, on the bandwagon. Those organizations, I think, will probably just become uh, they will be on the wrong side of history and will become irrelevant very quickly to society. Society will revoke their license to do business by not by not buying from them. So it's how do we serve these early adopters and these fast followers and make them successful? And and um and the, the those organizations in large part have been activated <clears throat> by the youth generation. Uh, or, or are formed and built by those people because the millennials now, Gen Z is now the largest workforce. If you're a CEO trying to win the war for talent, you have to be relevant to Gen Z. You have to. Um, I just posted on Twitter yesterday that there's this whole movement. Um, there's this whole movement called conscious quitting. <laughs> These millennials, they're not, it's not just their first job now. They're quitting their jobs if they're working for an organization that doesn't have strong values and positive, provable, verifiable action towards, um, you know, values-based approaches to society, climate action, for example. Wow, I got really excited about that, but it's, uh, it's a really big point. Yeah, and in fact, that's what I'm thinking. You should speak to the YNGers, the One World community, the, and the young Youngas are the uh, young uh, General Assembly, which is connected to the United Nations, right? So uh, th those three, <laughs> you'll hit thousands, uh, tens of thousands, over hundreds. hundred. Totally, yes. <laughs> so, and you get them driving uh, and they have so much energy, right? So. Yeah, I love it. I love it because they want it done properly. And right now, if there, there are business people who are going, well, we should buy carbon credits. And what they're doing is just going finding the cheapest carbon credits. Right. Which is complete. You might as well just drive down the road and throw tree seeds out of your car window. It's as valuable and impactful to the planet as that. This is not a time for cheapness. We need to do it properly. Absolutely. So we're we're down to the last couple of minutes of our of our interview of the hour that's been allocated. So, um, and the last question is: what what's your closing recommendations to our broad audience? <laughs> uh, my 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 first point is go to co2.com and call me simon at co2.com easy to find and um but get on the climate journey and let us know what's hard um because we want to make it easy and uh, and i mean that just in general like through time what, what stories can we tell of others um who, who have already if you've got a great story share it um it's that that's what we need we need storytelling um and part of what what i'm trying to do is just find easy buttons to make it easy for companies who are finding it hard to move to get going. Thank you very much, Stephen. It just occurred to me one other thought. Did you connect with Taha of, of the Goodwall? Because he's got uh, like 22 million on his platform, right? And so, poor young people. <laughs> I love Taha. He and I spent a lot of time together. Oh, okay. <laughs> he's got the energy of 50 people and he's built an amazing community that is truly world-class. And I want to do everything I can to make him successful.
Okay, that's great. You did connect. <laughs> yes, big time. Yeah. Okay, so again, thank you for coming in and sharing so many of your insights and, and journey with our audience. I just really enjoyed our, <laughs> our dialogue. And as I mentioned to the audience, it's all unscripted. So thank you again. Thank you, Stephen, very much. Thank you for listening to the brand called You Videocast and Podcast, a platform that brings you knowledge, experience, and wisdom of hundreds of successful individuals from around the world. Do visit our website, www.tbcy.in, to watch and listen to the stories of many more individuals. You can also follow us on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Just search for the brand called You.